Good morning, guys. It's Wednesday, September 9th. We are working on chapter three, right? Amino acids, peptides, and proteins. Now, can you hear me well? Yes? Yes. yes. Good. Yes. Good. We have uh, two more lectures on this chapter. And the homework is due uh, on Monday. Don't forget about that, right? So there are actually quite a few problems there, about 50, but many of them are um, just simple, simple multiple choice when you just, when it just tests your, um, quizzes you on your knowledge of the material. So, um, so the homework shouldn't be too, too bad. And plus we have four lectures, so, um, it will be good for you to actually to uh, to work through the problems associated with these four lectures. Okay, so as usual, I encourage you to ask me questions. And let's go to the material. Let me share the screen. I share the screen. So we last time we talked about ionization, right? So we finished by discussing the slide. And uh, so let's start here. This is slide 20. Slide 20. All right. So let me get the pen. Let me get the pen. Okay, so uh, so this is a titration curve of glycine, right? The simplest amino acid. Remember, glycine is the simplest one because there is no group R, right? So alpha carbon has two hydrogens. And remember, there are two protonatable sites. So each amino acid will have two proton protonatable sites. So one on the um, amino group, right? There is a lone pair and one on the carboxylate group, there's a lone pair. So if we go all the way to the left, before we added any base, it's just all we have is just glycine, right? So pH is very low, close, at some point close to zero. So as we start adding hydroxide ions, right? Very strong base. So in this state, both sides are protonated, right? Both the amino group is now, um, has a positive charge and the carboxylate, it doesn't have a charge, but it's protonated, right? It had charge before, but once you protonate, you remove the negative charge. So in this state, hydroxide ion starts to remove the most easily removable proton. And that will be on the carboxylic acid. So we talked about that last time, right? So the PKA of carboxylic acid is around well, two, in glycine is 2.34. And we expect to see, to find that PKA after we have added half of the equivalence of the hydroxide ions, right? So remember at this point, um, after you have one-to-one -one mixture of protonated and deprotonated acid and base, right? The PKA equals the pH of the solution. And so after we have added half of the equivalent of base, we achieve the pH of 2.34. And at this point, it equals the PKA. All right, so uh, we keep adding more base, more base, more base until almost all of the, in fact, all of the carboxylic acid will be deprotonated. Okay, so this is known as equivalence point, PI, equivalence point, or also known as isoelectric point, isoelectric point. Why is it isoelectric? Well, because 
and this amino acid here, uh, it's neutral, right? So the, um, the amino group is fully protonated, has a full positive charge. Carboxylate is fully deprotonated, has a full negative charge. And so the amino acid is neutral. So the, at this point, uh, in fact, if you put this uh, amino acid in the electric field, it will not migrate anywhere towards the, any of the electrodes because it's neutral, right? It, overall, the, the charge is zero. So, uh, so that's the PI. And that happens after we, we have added one equivalent of the hydroxide ion. Do you have any questions at this point? Is everything clear? It's very logical, very logical. Just don't forget that uh, carboxylic acids in amino acid are much more acidic than the, I mean, than the protonated amino groups. And so when you start adding base, you start deprotonating the carboxylic acid and not the amino group until you get to a point where all the carboxylic acid is fully deprotonated. And then as you start adding more base, then you start deprotonating the NH3+, which will go all the way to neutral, NH2. And this will also go through um, a point at which half of the um, NH3 plus is deprotonated, right? And that will be the pKa of the amino group. We call this P pKa2. PK1 and PK2, right? So there are two PKAs associated with amino acids, one for carboxylic acid, one for the protonated amino group, PK1 and PK2. And so PK2 is 9.6 for glycine. And at this point, the pH of the solution will be exactly that, 9.6. And then as we keep adding more base, then we go all the way to complete deprotonation. So now you can see both the amino group and the carboxylate group are fully deprotonated, fully deprotonated. So it's a pretty simple, um, pretty simple titration curve of glycine. In a moment, we're going to look at um, an amino acid that has a pro that has an ionizable side chain. So there, are things a little more complicated, but in essence, it's exactly the same thing. You just have to look for the lowest PKA, deprotonate that first. Then second lowest PKA, deprotonate that next. And then the last one, usually it will be the, the amino group. Okay. And so, yeah, remember uh, we talked about that uh, also this is known as Witter ion, right? So there's a term for this. This Witter ion in German means double. Zwitter, Zwitter ion, so it has both the positive charge and negative charge. So as we go to the next slide, so the Zwitter ions, they will predominate at pH values between the pKa values of the amino acid and, sorry, amino group and the carboxyl group, right? So it has to be in between. And in fact, the equivalence point or the <coughs> isoelectric point, pi, can be very easily found because it's actually the um, it's the uh, the average of the two PK, PK, pKa values, right? pKa for carboxylic acid and pKa for the protonated amino group. Just add these two, divide by two, and you find pi, right? So here in the previous example, if you add, I guess, uh, nine point six right 9.6 plus 2.3 2.34 divided by 2 now i don't have a calculator well i do but i'm not going to use it but you should get 
5.97. And that's the, that's the PI, ISO equivalence point, right? Okay. Well, so the charge of this with ion will be total zero. And uh, amino acid will be least soluble in water, right? So usually amino acids, if you think about it, so amino acids have uh, amino groups, which can form hydrogen bonds with water. They have carboxylate groups that can form hydrogen bonds with water. They charged, amino groups are protonated, carboxyl, carboxyl groups are deprotonated, positive, negative charge, charges. But in the state of Zwitterion at the PI, when the, um, when the amino group is fully protonated, the carboxylate is fully deprotonated, you have a Zwitterion, the amino acid will be the least soluble in water because the net charge is zero, right? And it will not migrate in the electric field because it has no charge. It has no reason to migrate towards positive or negative electrode. Any questions at this point? No? You haven't woken up yet? All right, let's move on then. So both the uh, carboxylate and the amino group are, um, when it's protonated, they're both weak acids, right? So you as we remember, weak acids can, and the, the mixture of weak acid and its conjugate base can serve as a buffer. And so amino acids can be used as buffers. And, um, So there are two buffers. There is one centering around 2.34. That will be the buffer for the carbox carboxylic group. And the other one centering around 9.6, that will be for the amino group. Two pH ranges, right? So you can see here, right? So uh, in this region, right? In the um, pH between one and three, you can see here we've added almost one equivalent of base, a huge amount of base, but the pH has changed very little, right? The pH has grown, but not by much. And the same thing here. So in this region, it can serve as a buffer, right? So you can use glycine as a, buff, as a buffer for this region of the pH values and for this region of the pH values. Change. Change in pH. Okay. All right. Uh, Dr. Kronika, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so amino acids with R side chains that have non-ionizable groups, will they all have the same PI then? Well, they will not have the same PI because uh, obviously if you uh, rem remove one of these hydrogens and replace them by, by group R, which is non-ionizable, as you said, uh, it will not affect the, the shape of the curve, right? So the shape of the curve will be exactly the same because there will be two ionizable groups, carboxylic right. groups and the, and the amino group, right? As you said. Um, but you will change the you will change the position of the uh, of the PKA values, for example, right? You will oh, change okay. the PKA values. If you change the PKA values, uh, hold on a second, why? If you change the PKAs, you will change the PI. Okay. So yeah, we'll change it a bit, but- um, It will have the 
the same like pattern. Yeah, but the curve, the shape of the curve, everything will be exactly the same, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, and so uh, here is, here we're gonna deal with the um, side chain, which is ionizable. So we're gonna look at the amino acid histidine, right? So again, so in fully protonated form, histidine has carboxylate protonated, has the amino group protonated, and has the nitrogen on the imidazole ring. Remember, this is called imidazole on in, in histidine. So this is fully pro protonated as well. And so it has uh, two positive charges, right? Um, there's no negative charge, just two positive charges. And so that's where we start before we add any base. But keep in mind, there are three protonatable sites. So there will be three possible state, um, well, four possible states, fully protonated, partially, partially, and completely deprotonated. So after the first PKA, so wh where do we start? Again, we start by deprotonating carboxylic acid because that will have the lowest PKA value. We call this PKA, PKA1, right? So as we start adding base, as we start adding base, after we've added half of the amount of base, we have deprotonated half of the carboxylic groups. So at this point, the uh, PKA will equal the pH. And in fact, you can determine the PKA value from here by measuring the pH value of the solution, right? You, you measure the pH and that will be the, so add half, equivalent, half of the equivalence of the base, measure the pH, and that will give you the, PK, the first PKA, PKA1. So uh, in this state, then uh, we gain a negative charge, right? So we still have two positive charges. They still remain there and one negative charge. So the, in, the sum is plus one. So uh, then we continue adding uh, more base. Now, after you've added one equivalent of base, I mean, this would look like it as a um, equivalence point somewhere here. You would think that, right? But the problem is it's not equivalence point, even though um, it's positioned properly, right? Between the, uh, the two um, PKA, uh, PKA values. But the problem is, is that in this state, we have the charge of plus one. So um, it's not an equivalence point because the molecule is still charged. So it's not as with ion, it's not neutral. Okay. So we then continue. So we've added one equivalent, fully deprotonated carboxylic group. And then we start, we continue adding base. And now we start deprotonating imidazole. So imidazole has a lower PKA than the amino group. So we start depro deprotonating imidazole after we have added now in total one and a half equivalents. This is one and a half, right, of base. So this additional half of equivalent deprotonated half of the imidazoles for us, right? So you can see here, there's a lone pair and there is a proton here. And that's what we're doing. We're going from the proton to the lone pair and the charge in the process disappears, right? So this is uh, half of it is deprotonated. That gives us the second PKA. Now, normally it's referred to as PKR, right? You still have PKA1, PKA2, but R basically stands for the side chain, right? 
So this will be the PKA of the side chain. So PKR, you can make a note to yourself. It's just a common way to abbreviate or common way to, ref to refer to as PKA of side chain. Okay, then we keep uh, adding and it's after we've added two full equivalents of hydroxide ion. Here is where we achieve the equivalence point. Why? Because now this charge is gone. All we have is just two charges left, plus and minus. This is a complete Zwitter ion, total charge is zero. So that's the PI of histidine. PI of histidine is 7.59. And finally, we still have one more proton left in this molecule. We need to add another equivalent of hydroxide to, de to, to remove it. And here we've added half of the hydroxide, half of the equivalents. So this will be PKA2, PKA2, 9.17. And eventually we've added another all full three equivalents of hydroxide to remove all three protons going from charge plus two to charge minus one, right? You need three equivalents of base to do that. So you basically uh, perform the same kind of experiment with any kind of ionizable um, amino acid. So the curves will be different depending on how many ionizable sites and what kind of ionizable sites you have in your side chain. Right, so, so this is positively charged histidine, but you can imagine that uh, it can be negatively charged. For example, asp um, aspartate, right, or glutamate. So those have carboxylic acids. So, so those will be slightly different. Um, I'm sure you can, uh, if you are not happy with the amount of homework I give you in sapling, something, this is something for you to practice. Right, you can always find the um, answers on Google. Just Google um, titration curve of aspartate. And, um, but try to do it yourself first, right? Try to do it yourself first using the same analysis as we just went through. And um, yeah, so um, any questions about titration or amino acids? So unless they're positively charged or negatively charged, will the calculation for PI be like um, PK1 or yeah, PK1 plus PK2 divided by two? Okay, so here it will be the, the two flanking ones. No, no, so, right. so, so it's here it's not gonna be PK1, PK2, it's gonna be PKR and PK2. I think, uh, hold on a second. No, yeah, but other than the positive and the negatively charged ones, will like the other ones be that way? Basically, it's a transition from, um, so here, and then, uh, yeah, I forgot about the slide. So how to calculate the PI when the side chain is ionizable. So identify the PKA value that defines the acid strength of this with ion. So uh, this will be the PKR. PKR, so that's the PK, PKA that leads towards the equivalency, towards the um, Zwitter ion, right? Then identify the PKA that defines the base strength of the Zwitter ion, PKA2. So in other words, we're going from here to there. So this will be PKR and PKA2. And then use these two and take the average of these two. Take the average of PKR and and PKA2. So in the previous example, so what is the P P uh, PI of histidine? You go to the previous example. So here you will um, add 6.0, right? So PI here will be 6.0. Six point oh 
plus 9.17. divided by two. And you can check the math, that should be 659. Yeah, this is this is the answer to the question. I was asking like, other than the positive or negatively charged, like not histidine, but like, um, like phenylalanine, for example, how would you calculate that one? Oh, phenylalanine will be the same as glycine. Okay, yeah, that's what I was asking about. Perfect. Yeah, here, same as glycine. So whether you have a two, two, C, two hydrogens or one R and one hydrogen, if it's, if, as long as it's not uh, non-ionizable, it's gonna be the same curve okay. and, you'll, and you'll calculate it. Um, where was this, using this expression, yes. Okay, perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Kornicka, I have a question. Yeah. Um, when we're talking about deprotonation, uh, like the different side, side chains and the carboxylic group and the amino group, is it always like the carboxylic group first and then the hydrogens in the R side chain and then the amino group last? Like what if the in this R side chain, there's also like an amino group or a carboxylic group? Because they have the yeah. same values. Yeah, yeah. So they happen at the same yeah, yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it doesn't have to be. Right, so for example, the PKA values of um, side chains in um, in um, what is it the uh, uh, arginine, for example, uh, PKA of side chain in arginine will be higher than the, than the PKA of the primary amino group. In that case, the PKR and PKA two they will switch. That will switch. So, uh, right. So, PKR doesn't always have to be in between of the two, right? It can be on either side of the two. Let's say if uh, if it's arginine and the PKA is higher, it will be on this side. Let's say if it's aspartate or glutamate and the PKA of the carboxylic acid is lower than the PKA of the of this carboxylic acid, then it will be on that side. Right, so the curve, uh, so the base, based on that, the curve can be, um, the curve will change depending on the PKA of the ionizable side chain. Yeah. The lower the PKA, it's getting protonated, deprotonated first. The lower the PKA, it will be deprotonated first, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so, um, so these are four amino acids. Now, um, I mean, acids by themselves are interesting, but uh, what's uh, the purpose of um, this class is primarily the proteins, right? So it's good for us to know the properties of amino acids, but uh, it's even more important for us to know what happens when amino acids combine together to form peptides and proteins. So peptides are small condensation products of amino acids, right? So um, they're smaller than proteins. So less than 10,000, right? So less than 10,000 um, Daltons. Now, so in other words, you can uh, also say atomic mass units, right? So basically um, go by the molecular weight. Less than 10,000 peptides. More than 10,000 proteins. So that's, um, now it's uh, not set in stone. Some people will still refer to something bigger than 10,000 as a peptide, if they feel like, like doing so. So it's, um, so there's no uh, set in stone rule for that. This is just, just this is just a, a, a guide. A guide for us to, when somebody says peptide, you usually think of something that has less than 10,000 in molecular weight. And so how do these, these things form? So carboxylic acids, we know that these react with amines, right? To form amides. And now you have a nice, nice amide group. Amide groups are very strong. We know that. 
right? They're not very hydrolyzable. That's why nature chose amides over esters, for example. So compare, 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 let's say, an ester with with an amide right so in organic chemistry in ochem one we learned in ochem two as well right We learned that amides are much are hydrolyzed much more easily. Hydrolysis fast with amides, hydrolysis is slow. Hydrolysis is slow. So um, that's why the um, emits form the backbones of, pep of proteins and peptides. They're quite stable. Even though, as we know, there are proteins, uh, enzymes that are designed to break the amide bonds, right? So, but that's enzymatic catalysis. So without enzymatic catalysis, it's not easy to break the amide bond, right? So, um, and the reason for that, if you, uh, it would be good to, for us to actually, to know that the reason for that is the resonance structure, right? Going like this, resonance. All right, to see so since you're attending the um, the lecture, I'm going to reveal one of the questions on the exam. So I just told you about resonance here, right? Which is um, responsible for the stability of the amides. Why the same resonance does not make esters stable. So think about it. I don't want the answer right now. Um, think about it and um, be prepared to answer it on the test. I just need to make a note for myself to come up with a question like that for the test. Right? So um, slide. For, for the test one. Test one. All right. So uh, you can put a whole bunch of these uh, amino acids together so it can form a polymer, right? And so generally, um, when we draw a peptide or a protein, we start with the amino terminus on the left, and we end with the carboxyl terminus on the right. And so amino acids are usually drawn with the amino group on the left and the carboxyl on the right. And the side chains, yeah, you can put them on top or bottom, that's up to you. That doesn't really matter so much, but you can see here, so uh, this peptide, for example, will be, um, you can use three of our ways to um, name the peptide, right? Serial, glycyl, tyrosyl, alanine, leucine. 
Now you can use a three letter code abbreviation, serine, glycine, tyrosine, alanine, leucine. And uh, obviously if you have a longer protein and you're involved in things like bioinformatics and computer modeling, you will use single letter abbreviation. So it's, um, so this will be a pentapeptide, right? So, so for peptides, the number of amino acids you can uh, describe by prefix. So this will be one, two, three, four, five, penta. Peptide. Okay. Any questions? It's pretty straightforward. Can you like go over more about the the bond that you were talking about between the nitrogen? On the previous slide what about it i think i've told you quite a bit what else do you want to know uh, i'm I, honestly i just don't get why it would give the partial double bond character on the mean and not the ester well that's something for you to think about it so that's why i said i'm not going to tell you because i don't want to give away the answer of what's going to be on the test but um this is something that you should be able to uh, explain based on the organic chemistry principles, right? That's why organic chemistry was one of the prerequisites. So basically what you need to do is, um, so to do this exercise, you have to draw the um, resonance structure from the amide, right? And then do the same with the ester. Uh, draw the resonance structure for the ester, right? and compare the two resonance structures, the ester one and the amide one, and, and answer the question, why is the resonance structure for the amide, why is that much more stable than the resonance structure for the ester? Uh, a hint for you, the main, the main hint, of course, is the fact that you replace in nitrogen with oxygen. So it, it comes down to the fundamental difference in some property of nitrogen and oxygen. Okay. Think about it. Think. If you um, have some ideas, put them in the discussion sec as a section of. Um, so, if you want to start a discussion on this, in uh, on Canvas, I only um, support that, and I'll participate in that. Okay. So peptides um, have a variety of functions. Again, these are small, uh, less than 10,000 Dalton molecules. So insulin, um, as we know, well, some people refer to insulin as a protein, but it's actually, I think the molecular weight around 6,000. So it's, it's not really a protein. It's a, it's a small protein, basically peptide. So we know that insulin is important for sugar metabolism, right? Produced by pancreas, goes to the cells and tells the cells, if there's too much glucose in the blood, you, you better take it out of the blood and metabolize it, right? Now, oxytocin produced in the brain and causes the, goes to the uterus and causes the uterine contractions. Uh, sex peptide, now for mating in insects. So all these are small ones, right? Some of the antibiotics, uh, which are used to treat bacteria, for example, polymyxin B, one of our last resort antibiotics, you know about antibiotic crisis, right? Now, obviously COVID has um, um, come to the, um, to our, uh, has become our biggest worry right now, but um, we should we should not forget that there are still bacterial infections, especially hospital acquired bacterial infections, which are untreatable, right? So um, 
a person goes to the hospital, picks up one of these infections, and then tries any antibiotic on, in the world, and none of them works. And so polymyxin B, for example, is one of the last resort antibiotics for um, gram-negative bacteria, uh, which can be acquired in the hospital. Um, bacitracin. So a lot of toxins are peptides, right? Scorpions, snails, mushrooms. Okay, so I think that should be sufficient for the peptides. So we now moving on to larger molecules, moving on to proteins. So I guess uh, I always, uh, I'm always confused by this term polypeptides, but I guess in this text, they use this term polypeptides as this another word for proteins. Okay, so polypeptides and proteins. So let's uh, use this convention in our class. So when we cite, when we say polypeptides, that should mean proteins with molecular weight more than ten thousand. And so uh, we have, we should not forget that um, when we talk about proteins, there are also a lot of other groups uh, and units that can be associated with proteins, right? So for example, cofactors. So we know that many metals, so we, there are many, there, there are reasons why people take um, multi mineral uh, supplement with their diet, for their diet, right? And one of the reasons for that is that many enzymes that work in the body require metal ions to function. Right, this can be manganese, can be zinc, can be calcium, can be iron. So, um, so these are usually referred to as cofactors, right? And they are important. They're important for the functioning of proteins, which behave as enzymes, catalytic. Now there are coenzymes. Um, so these are actually again they're smaller usually organic cofactors, organic cofactors as opposed to as opposed to inorganic. And so these are used in for many uh, functions, for example, for oxidation reduction, right? So for example, lactate dehydrogenase, right? So this is a redox enzyme, the enzyme which performs oxidation reduction and it uh, uses this cofactor Nicotine adenine dinucleotide. We actually we're going to look at that co uh, coenzyme in more detail later. But <coughs> uh, it, this co this coenzyme here is in a in the form that is about to perform an oxidation. It's positively charged. It wants electrons. Then prosthetic groups. Uh, usually, when people when somebody says prosthetic group, the most famous one is heme in myoglobin or hemoglobin. So usually the compared with coenzymes, these will be covalently attached. So the part of the um, part of the proteins, right? And so when we talk about protein function, we're going to talk almost for half of the like half, almost half of the entire chapter, I think it's chapter five, we're going to talk about hemoglobin and myoglobin. And specifically, we'll be talking about the structure of heme and its role in oxygen transport, right? So this will be a prosthetic group. And of course, there are other modifications. We already looked at those uh, post-translational modifications. Remember this term? Do we remember this term? Anybody can remind us what that means? Post-translational modification, what does that mean? Like folding and stuff of the proteins after it's translated? Well, that would um, could be in principle, yes, but that's not what it's used for. When somebody says post-translation modification, usually they don't really uh, mean what, what you just said. Usually people refer to that as uh, three-dimensional assembly or folding, as you said, but, but not really 
post-translational modifications. Usually this means covalent. Would it be splicing? Oh. So not splicing, this is, did you say splicing? So, so this is post-translational already. So this is once the, so translation remember is for, is synthesis of protein on the ribosomes, right? So once the, um, the protein has been synthesized, what happens after that? An enzyme will come in and add an alcohol group? Yes, the enzymes can come in and start uh, performing some chemistry on proteins, right? Start turning the amino acids into something other. And, and as you said, maybe add a hydroxy group somewhere. We, we looked at, for example, at hydroxyproline, right? Or 5-hydroxylysine uh, components of collagen, amino acids which are part of collagen. So, uh, so these are post-translation modifications. And so, uh, so proteins, we should uh, keep in mind that even though there are 20 amino acids, there are also, the, the proteins can contain amino acids which have been modified chemically, right? In addition to all this other st stuff. So proteins are very complex, right? Very complex and we are going to learn a lot of this complexity in this class. So here are some examples of um, various proteins. You can see they vary in their molecular weight and number of residues. So these are number of amino acid residues. So for example, cytochrome C, right, uh, is just above 10,000. So it's almost like it's a peptide, but it's a small protein. You can say ribonuclease A um, is just above 10,000 and only 100 amino acid residues. But then, um, now here's a question for you, something to think about right rather than just memorize so the molecular weights of these two cytochrome c and ribonuclease a are very close and yet the number of residues is significantly different there are 20 more residues in ribonuclease a how can we explain that shouldn't the molecular weight increase proportionally with the number of residues So you just added 20 extra amino acids, but the molecular weight has increased by just, just a thousand, small amount. What do you think? Get those brains working this morning. Would it be because the residues are negligible in sense of weight, like they don't carry much weight with them? What do you say, what do you mean by negligible? I think you're on the right path. What's, what do you mean by negligible? Um, like they don't, they're small in compared to- Perfect, they're small. The they're, yes, yes, they're lighter, they're lighter. They don't, they don't have so, so much molecular weight. So in other words, even though we have 20 amino acids, but their molecular weights are drastically different. And there are proteins which are primarily composed of light amino acids, and there are proteins which are composed of, of heavy amino acids. And so the number of residues can only be a rough, a rough indication of a, of a predicted molecular weight. In fact, um, on, um, on Friday, I'll show you uh, the exact numbers. I'll show you the exact numbers and we'll go through some exercise to actually um, to predict the predict number of residues in a particular protein based on its molecular weight. And so, uh, and then uh, it increases and it goes all the way to a protein in the muscle in Titan. You can see here it's a huge protein, has 27,000 amino acids, uh, 3 million molecular weight, huge protein. And you can see the proteins, they also differ in their um, so number of subunits, right? So there are multi-subunit proteins. 
and uh, they uh, most of them are non-covalently associated and if these subunits are the same then we say that the peptide is oligomeric oligomeric uh, um, if they're different we just say it's a multi multi subunit protein right so hemoglobin as we will learn in chapter five has four subunits two alpha subunits and two beta subunits so these the two alphas are identical two betas are identical so it's not fully oligomeric but it's it's a subunit that com com is composed of two oligomeric subunits or tetramer you can just say it's a tetramer that's the easiest way to describe it tetramer guys any questions about the lecture today about anything in this class so i have office hours coming up in a few minutes after this um, continue working with the discussion on canvas right and i'll see you on friday stay healthy thank you, thank you. bye